Uh, well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, uh, to everyone in the room and everyone who's joining online. We've got a lot of people uh, watching online too. So my name's Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute uh, here at King's, and I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this event, which is hosted by the Policy Institute jointly in partnership with the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at uh, King's. And it, and it really couldn't be uh, a more important time to hold this type of event as the excellent uh, joint report with HEPI. Uh, big thanks to HEPI for their, their work on that uh, outline. Uh, so there's lots of aspects to policy in the political context that makes it particularly vital for us to think about this right now, not least the government's stated aim to cement the UK's place as a science and technology superpower by 2030. We've seen the focus on maths to 18 in schools and encouragement for more people to take up STEM degrees at university. Lots of active policy and political decisions. There is, on the other hand, no lack of advocates, you'll see, you know, with even a cursory look um, for the humanities, um, often pushing for a much more balanced uh, view of how they relate to things like technology, particularly AI, given our particular focus on chat GPT and all the generative AI potential that we have right now. So I did just this week, you may have seen Andy Haldane give his talk uh, on this sort of subject, saying uh, we've seen the dwindling numbers of young people taking arts and humanities, and that is a big mistake for jobs and skills for tomorrow. We are enumerate as a nation, very bold statement from Andy there, agreeing with uh, the government. We are enumerate uh, as a nation, and the PM is right there, but it's not just about STEM. What will protect us uh, from the rise of AI is our creative capacity as human beings. And uh, yeah, again, we might not all agree that we need to be protected from AI, but the importance of creativity in this is uh, really important. But there are dwindling numbers studying humanities in universities. That continues. It is dwindling. It's not the wholesale collapse that some people make out, as, you, as the report points out, uh, and Marion, I'm sure, will cover. Uh, but that rhetoric and policy focus do remain quite widespread. So, is this a crisis? Uh, and in any case, even if it's not a crisis, what can and should we do? Um, and that is the focus for tonight. And we couldn't have a better panel to discuss this uh, as a subject. Uh, first up, we'll uh, hear from Marion Thane, who, Professor Marion Thane, who's Executive Dean of the Faculty of the Arts and Humanities uh, here at King's, and who was one of the key authors of the report. So we'll get about 10 minutes. Uh, on that from Marion, just the key themes from that. And then we'll have six or seven minutes uh, from uh, Dr. Molly Morgan-Jones, who is Director of Policy at the British Academy. And then finally, same sort of thing from uh, Lord Joe Johnson, who is former Minister of State for Universities, Science, Research and Innovation, when it was all together. And uh, visiting professor, uh, delighted to say, here at uh, the Policy Institute uh, at King's. Then we'll have time to hear from the audience, um, and we are lucky this evening because we've got a few of the authors, or joint authors of the report in the audience, as well as others who've contributed to the, to, contributed to the debate, so we'll look to come to uh, them, as well as questions from all of you. And then we'll look to be done by 7.15 uh, for some more casual conversations over drink not least because I need to get home to watch Arsenal versus Man City. Uh, I'm going to get very edgy. There's shaking of heads from, from people there. I don't feel the love for <laughs> that here. But yeah, we'll make sure that we're on time uh, for 7.15 and more casual discussion after uh, that. So first up, over to you, Marion. So thank you very much, Bobby, for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, are the humanities in crisis? Well, in 1947, Lauren McKinney certainly thought so when he published his article, Three Types of Defensive Reaction to the Humanities Crisis. And in 1966, J.H. Plum certainly thought so when he wrote his article, Crisis in the Humanities. And in 1975, <laughs> Mel Topp thought so when he published his article, The NEH, The National Endowment for the Humanities, and The Crisis in the Humanities. <laughs> In 1990, Stuart Hall also thought so when he published his article, The Emergence of Cultural Studies and the Crisis of the Humanities. And in 2005, Geoffrey Hartman did too when he published his article intriguingly titled Beneath and Beyond the Crisis in the Humanities. So I could go on and on and on. We're barely into the 20th century, 21st century with this list yet. Um, it's been great fun, and thanks to all the colleagues who've helped me compile a full bibliography of Crisis in the Humanities articles. It's very extensive. Um, but we've been beneath, beyond, the left off to the right of the Crisis in the Humanities for a century now. 
I'm not sure we need another century of talking about the crisis in humanities. I'm not sure this is the, the most interesting and meaningful conversation that we can have. I think what we need to do is to think about what the real value of the sector is and how to nurture that and get the benefit of it in the best possible way for society, for our students, for our country and for our world. Um, so to put my point perhaps another way, we can tell the story of the humanities in many different ways. We could say, well, the data says that philosophy has been losing market share since 500 BC. <laughs> this, is a, this is a discipline in crisis. Look, it's a discipline in crisis. Um, is that a useful or meaningful story to tell? I'm not sure it is. You know, humanities gave birth to some of the a plethora of the multiple disciplines we see around us today. It's been a hugely successful discipline and it still sort of holds that place as a motor for the conceptual underpinnings for a lot of what we do across the other disciplines. So we think a different kind of story needs to be told, a different conversation needs to be had around the humanities. Um, and as I say, the real story, actually, is that the humanities are a major asset to the UK and we need to work out better how to foster and how to get the benefit of that for everybody in the country. So that's what brought together a group of us, mostly deans in the arts and humanities, but other leaders in the arts and humanities too, to write this report, this little blue book that you're either sitting on or looking at now, um, to, to really give, to, to give you some evidence what's actually going on in the humanities today. And I just want to summarize in three key points some of our main findings from the report. Firstly, Far from being a sector in crisis, the UK humanities is a globally leading humanities sector. And we give you some evidence for that in the report around citation metrics, around um, outputs and research in the humanities. It's really, if we think of the higher education sector broadly in the UK as being one of the really internationally most respected things about the country, then the humanities is a jewel in that crown, it really is. And you can see that if you look at that in the global picture through those international citation metrics. Secondly, another claim that we get to give a lot of evidence for in the report is that humanities projects are having huge impact in terms of helping us solve some of the really key challenges of today. So we give a lot of different case studies from many different institutions across the country, but I'm going to draw attention just to two things that I think will help to bring this home now in relation to recent events. We've just been through a pandemic. Um, maybe we're not through it yet, I don't know, but we're acting as if we are anyway. But uh, um, we, it, there was a really urgent search for vaccines in that pandemic. Our scientists were really crucial to that effort. But actually, those vaccines would have had no effect if we couldn't persuade communities to take them. There was a big piece of work around understanding of cultural diversity, understanding of communication across cultural boundaries, understanding of the kinds of systems of belief, the needs, the desires of our very, very diverse communities in the UK and beyond that was really necessary to try and land that piece of scientific work. It's only through sciences, arts, humanities, all of our disciplines really working hand in hand in tandem that we're going to be able to address the really major challenges of our age. We can't just say STEM, go and fix it. That's not going to work. It's not going to happen. We need both. We need arts, humanities, social sciences, STEM. We need all of these things and we need them working in concert. The other brief example I want to give is you all have read in the news recently about this uh, group of global tech leaders calling for a pause in the development of AI. That's not because we can't code well enough. It's not because we don't have the technical skills to push AI forward. It's because we don't yet have the sufficient framings to ensure that AI is going to work for social good, to support human flourishing, and for the benefit of everybody in society. What's missing here is a profound knowledge of ethics, diversity, bias, all of these things that humanity subjects bring in spades to um, our understanding of technology in culture and society. This is where we really need our digital humanists. This is where we really need those colleagues coming and working from the humanities hand in hand with colleagues in technology and STEM to unlock a better future for us all. So 
read the report. There's lots of really interesting, real examples, um, evidence of their impact in society. These are essential projects um, for us to move forward. Thirdly, and really crucially, actually, um, we talk in the report about the absolute necessity of the skills that the humanities subjects give to our students and to the workforce more generally. So the, the sub humanities subjects may not deliver students as directly to a, a, a job in the way that vocational training might, but what they give is priceless because what they give is robustness and flexibility for long and varied careers. And what we know now is that our young people today are going to have much longer careers, much more varied careers than anybody has had, previous generations have ever had. We need to future-proof things for them, and the humanities give a great foundation, um, a great set of skills that employers can tailor and bring into, you know, add bits of technical training to, um, but they really give that longevity uh, in, in the workplace. Um, and this is where I'm so delighted to have Molly with us on this panel, because we draw a lot on the British Academy's research in our report. And as, as Molly and her team have, have told us in their work, eight out of 10 of the fastest growing sectors of employment have majority recruitment from arts uh, and humanities and social sciences graduates. That's a really powerful statistic, I think, and tells us something really important. We've also got to think about mentioned AI, about the kinds of areas that AI is going to move into and take over, um, and what jobs are going to be available in 10 years, 20 years, not just now. So there's no point in just preparing students for the jobs that we know are there today. We know that we don't know what the jobs are going to be tomorrow. Um, and again, arts and humanities give a great future proofing because while I'm told that ChatGPT can write an LSAT essay, that's the Law School Admissions Test essay, that scores over 90%, I have tried ChatGPT with an exercise in close reading, literally close reading and interpretation, and it's nowhere, nowhere near that. If you set AI the task of doing that kind of original close reading exercise, which is core to the humanities, it won't do very well. I think there's something really important here that's only just coming to light with these new tools like ChatGPT, which is which skills are more future-proofed, which skills are going to be the better bet for the long term. We have to look towards the future. Let's think about where we're going to be um, in 10, 20 years' time, um, not where we've come from in the past. So those are some of the things that we talk about in the report. And in conclusion then, I think we're really talking about recognizing that the UK humanities is a globally leading sector. It's a sector that is essential to helping us solve some of the really key challenges of the current time. And it's also a sector that provides absolutely crucial skills and expertise for the workforce of the future and for individual student careers to be long lasting, flourishing, um, and very generative for those individuals for the future. Um, if I run out of time, I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Marian. Um, just actually, before we go on to Molly, just get, get her response, can we just do a quick show of hands of who works in the humanities or studied the humanities? I just want to know whether we're all preaching to the choir. <laughs> we are preaching to the <laughs> choir. This is quite a solid choir, although there isn't, there's some sort of uh, interlopers in between, so that's quite good. That will come, come in handy when we get to some of the discussion and challenges. Very good, but yeah, good mix. Molly. Good. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks to King's and the Policy Institute for inviting me uh, to be here today. Uh, Mary and I should have probably coordinated um, notes because I'm probably going to say a lot of what she's just already uh, gone through. But um, uh, as Bobby said, I'm the Director of Policy at the British Academy. The British Academy is the UK's National uh, Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences or as we have started to refer to them collectively as the shape disciplines. Um, and Joe was testing me on what that acronym actually means if you've not come across it, but social sciences, humanities, and the arts for people and the economy. Though the acronym itself isn't so important as to what, you know, how we can use shape as a sort of collective um, term and how it works together with um, all the disciplines. Uh, and, and I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, but as kind of uh, a funder, a fellowship of leading academics and the national voice for the disciplines, um, this whole debate and topic is a lot of what I do day to day. So taking the prompt of the session, are the humanities in crisis? Um, I think the picture is nuanced, as Marion um, has just taken us through and the report um, says. And the evidence point 
points in a few directions about what the state of humanities um, is, though I would um, end in the same conclusion, that actually the picture is really strong, and we need to then challenge ourselves to think about you know, give, gain confidence from that to say, actually, let's build on that and let's um, try to make the positive case for, for why these disciplines are, are so critical. I thought it might be first taking a step back and thinking, what do we mean by crisis? So crises are moments that might be about extreme uncertainty, uh, they have a lot of complexity in them, and they might require a necessity to respond uh, urgently uh, and adapt uh, to avoid kind of serious harm. So if we take those sort of three criteria uh, in turn um, are humanities in a crisis. Um, so there is uncertainty about the future of the humanities due to a range of very rapidly changing political, social, technological contexts. But actually, are the humanities alone in that? Or is that a sector-wide challenge? And that's part of, of what we're facing now. And actually, if we look at just the humanities, uh, as, as we've seen in the report, there's considerable continuity. And history has shown us, actually, that the humanities uh, have been really resilient through many periods of, uh, peri previous periods of disruption. And when we look at the context of the health of the, the, the humanities uh, in, in, in light of the research sector itself and the economy, the picture is actually really strong. So REF 2021, which gives some of us kind of shivers and, and horrors, uh, but now it's behind us so we can sort of uh, take a breath, um, found that majority of humanities research across the UK is world leading or internationally excellent. Uh, and I don't need to rehearse that data here for this crowd as, as we've just seen. Um, but extending that out, when we look at skills gained from a humanities degree, these are skills that are vital to a thriving economy. Um, and I'm really pleased to see so much of the work that we've done at the British Academy uh, referenced in the report. Um, as Marion just said, humanities and social sciences graduates underpin eight of the 10 fastest growing sectors in the UK economy and employ more graduates uh, from the humanities and social sciences than from other disciplines. Um, our work uh, for that report also found that um, graduates from across social sciences and humanities are highly employable and they're more resilient to economic upheaval. upheaval. And contrary to popular perception, and particularly in the media uh, and, and, and other rhetoric, which I'll come back to, employment rates for shape graduates and postgraduates are almost identical to those for their STEM counterparts. Mm -hmm. And actually, over time, though immediately upon graduation, you might see a difference in graduate outcomes data, which again, I'll come back to. Actually, the, 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 the trend is that those uh, uh, wage disparities start to even out and even can, can, can intersect back to this point about dynamic and, and resilient skills that come from those disciplines. Um, if we look just at the, at the humanities and we zoom in on one of the fastest growing sectors in the UK, the creative economy, uh, we know that 25% of arts and humanities graduates find work in the creative sector and arts and humanities graduates are three times more likely to be in a creative job than other graduates. So this is a sector of the economy that was growing at twice the rate of the regular UK economy from 2014 to 2020, um, and they're employing you know, a, a large number of humanities uh, and arts graduates together. And I could go on with more data points on that sector, but, but you get the point. We're also doing a lot of work at the Academy on where shape uh, research is playing a role in R&D in the wider economy. And this gets into very technical definitions of how we define R&D. But we do know that um, of the top five R&D performing sectors in the economy, four employ more non-science graduates than science graduates. And again, those non-science graduates are coming from social sciences, uh, humanities, and the arts. So you know, regardless of the roles uh, those individuals are playing, they are part of that really productive kind of um, R&D-based economy. Our second criterion for a crisis is about complexity. And I would say there is complexity here in that there's difference across the disciplines um, within the humanities. And there's a range of factors affecting <coughs> uptake and uh, application rates. Uh, and some of that is in the report, and I won't go through it here. But if we do focus on the health of the sector from a pipeline and student number perspective, we do need to be on the alert, I think. And that's you know not telling anyone what they don't already know. Um, at the Academy, we've recently launched a SHAPE Observatory where we've made a commitment to monitor some of these trends uh, in a dynamic fashion um, and share them with the wider community. So if you haven't had a chance to look, I do encourage you to go and tell us what other data would be useful. We're just building up the data sets here. Um, but our most recent report where we looked at GCSE and A-levels um, has shown that, there, yes, there has been a challenging decade if we look at that pipeline uh, into graduate degrees uh, in the, the humanities in particular. But when you take a look at that data you know, um, and really scratch the surface, you see the numbers vary by geography, by discipline, and by education level. Um, so we shouldn't be complacent, but we should be aware that, that the picture is um, complex. I think another point about complexity that's worth talking about is the rhetoric around low value degrees, which I do think, especially when we get to you know, 
what might we do about this, that, that we need to think um, and challenge some of this low value degree rhetoric. Um, so the issue here is that there's a lot of government and media rhetoric around these low value degrees without necessarily a clear definition of what we mean. Now, there is a very specific you know, way of thinking about that that's linked to graduate salaries, uh, which I've just gone through, and that's kind of the economic value. Um, and there is a perception that humanities and arts degrees can lead to lower um, graduate earnings, so the, there are so-called so low-value courses. Um, but I think when it comes to this issue of value, using graduate earnings as a way to value education does fail to recognize that the return from higher education isn't just about and shouldn't solely be measured by graduate earnings. And actually, our disciplines give us the tools, the humanities give us the tools to start to talk about a much more nuanced and richer discussion about what value we get um, from, from degrees in these subjects. So these could be about quality of job, they could be about um, wider social and cultural value, they could, could be about place of the jobs, and really importantly, they could be about the sector of the economy that those um, people with those degrees are working in. That could be um, public sector jobs, teachers, carers, nursery workers, etc. And we shouldn't conflate the value that those jobs give to society with um, their, their economic value in terms of earnings. And then the final component of crisis is around kind of um, the urgent need for change and adaptation. And again, I would say the humanities, but really all subjects, do need to respond to some of the crises um, that we're facing related to new technologies, political volatility, policy change, market pressures, I could go on. Um, but there's really unprecedented challenges that all of our disciplines need to come together to give us an understanding of. And the humanities in particular can give us that understanding of culture, of history, of language, of values. Um, and that can work really um, beautifully and wonderfully together with the sciences, the engineers, the, the data sciences. I'll just say one further thing about this idea about kind of strategic and global um, important, uh, gl the global value of, of our disciplines. Um, a little bit of a preview, we have forthcoming work um, that does a lot of uh, very detailed citation and scientometric analysis that does show that one of the UK's greatest assets uh, in humanities uh, has to do with its high level of global connectedness across the sector. Um, and the UK continues to gain attention for its high quality work. And when you compare the global connectedness across the social sciences, humanities and the arts in the UK with the EU 27 and the US, the UK really does hold its own. So the data and the evidence does show us quite strongly and quite powerfully that there is real strategic advantage here in the UK with these disciplines. And I think then the question for all of us is, let's give ourselves confidence in all that data, but let's also try to use that to encourage government, to encourage businesses to really make the most of that um, strength and talent to really uh, uh, double down and, and, and maximize the opportunities for a strategic advantage that we have. Awesome. Thank you. That was a really powerful collection <laughs> of evidence. Yeah, very good. I think we maybe get into a discussion about uh, why is that rhetoric not holding, not taking hold, because yeah. that's probably not the message that is being picked up. So but let's come, come back to that after we hear from Joe. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Bobby. Well, going third, um, I'm going to repeat, I'm afraid, much of the brilliant points that uh, Molly and Marion have made much more eloquently um, than me. Um, are the humanities in crisis? Um, Marion made the point that this has been uh, foretold by many people over the years. I've always been skeptical of this prediction. You know, when I look around, they seem to me to be continuing to be absolutely central to our success as a knowledge economy. Um, this excellent new happy report underscores that we might as well kiss goodbye to our hope of becoming or remaining a science superpower um, in the absence of uh, the strong humanities research that we produce. Half of all UK science is below world average in terms of its citation impact. That might sound a striking fact, but it's true and it's a function of the skewed uh, parameters in citations and it's common for many countries. But what drags us up as a, as a science nation above world average is not just um, the world-class STEM that's produced in a number of our research intensive institutions, but it is also our humanities research. And the report um, highlights this fact well, and it says that our humanities research is almost 50% above world average in terms of field-weighted <laughs> citation impact. So we shouldn't forget that um, when we go out and around saying, you know, we're a science superpower. It's to a great extent due also um, to the strength of our, our humanities research. Um, yet, judging from um, a lot of the government's rhetoric, you would, you would think that the government or, or sort of parts of um, the political system were uh, ambivalent about the humanities and, and sort of 
you know, wouldn't mind if the pipeline of talent into this area of academia um, were, to, were significantly to dry up. Um, the, the era in which UK governments set ambitious targets for the expansion of the HE system have, have long passed. Um, the sector's critics generally are in the ascendancy and routinely describe higher education as bloated and wasteful of public resources. Um, while there is very strong support for STEM subjects, that's recently been matched only by scepticism uh, about the value of much higher education in the humanities and social sciences. Um, recent industrial strategies have put STEM centre stage, but they've made very little reference to um, arts and humanities and social sciences, with only sort of glancing references to the creative industries, which Molly's just mentioned. The upshot um, from the policy making's perspective is that the business of universities charging £9,250 for an unlimited number of non-STEM uh, tickets to higher education is one that the government you know, in recent years would quite happily see shrink. Um, and this attitude, you may remember, led to the Auger Review back in 2018, which starkly declared that there was an oversupply of non-STEM courses and argued very powerfully um, in terms of its impact on government for a reallocation of resources on the grounds that there was a misalignment between the state's subsidy into the loan book and the needs of the economy. Um, Auger, in his review, came pretty close to claiming that the sector had been effectively profiteering by ramping up the supply of courses for which it charged the full whack of 9,250 when it cost uh, the sector on average around 7,500 pounds to provide these same courses. And this narrative, um, which was embedded by the Auger, re <coughs> Auger Review, was very much music to the ears of the Treasury and to critics of the sector um, in, the, in, in, in the right of the Conservative Party. It gave considerable legitimacy to the idea that the humanities and social sciences represented a bad deal for the taxpayer as they delivered lower earnings, they repaid uh, more slowly than STEM courses, and they therefore consumed, um, at, in the view of the Auger Review, um, an unhealthy share of the government subsidy to the student loan book. So this sense that universities have been almost deliberately mis-selling courses that are unsuitable both for students and taxpayers' needs is at the heart of the problem facing the humanities. So is a humanities degree worth it? Well, clearly, that depends on how you're measuring value. And this, was, this is a point that Molly was making towards the end of her remarks. The, the danger of reducing everything to the earnings data, the, what are now known as the graduate outcomes metrics, is that it can give, at best, only a partial and unreliable answer to that question. The Auger Review's very reductive approach to this question has, as I said, legitimised the Treasury's use of earnings data and very speculative forecasts of loan repayments over a 40-year borrowing period as a proxy for the worth and value of a degree. It has hardened the Treasury's preference for courses that look like they will repay the student loan quickly and confirmed its basic dislike of those courses that don't. A humanities training may not pay back most quickly in the workforce, but good communication and analytical skills may in fact be more likely to provide resilience and longevity for longer term prospects. So as Molly and Marion were also arguing, to that extent, the value of the humanities is likely to hold up relatively well in a storm of technological change narrow, professional-oriented degree courses, while often seeming like a better financial bet in the short term with a nice, fast payback for the Treasury, may not give as flexible a foundation of learning as the humanities. Use of AI in STEM would appear to be a case in point. 
many people believe that AI, uh, and, and, and Marion was arguing this, will significantly, for example, <coughs> change the role of software developers. There has been a considerable discussion of AI making coding, for example, obsolete over the next few years. And to my mind, this is a very salutary um, warning to policymakers who think that they can predict skills needs specifically in the years to come. Um, as Martha Lane Fox put it recently, and uh, you gave me Al Andy Haldane, I'll trump you with Martha Lane <laughs> Fox, the, the course correction towards more coding has been misplaced because the machines are going to do the coding. We need to encourage the human skills, the ability to be critical about the world around us. Now, as AI becomes more prevalent, the ability to think creatively and critically, to communicate effectively and understand human behavior and culture will almost certainly become more important in many industries. Now, the trouble with this argument is that we don't yet have the data to support this conjecture. Mm -hmm. The size and expected government subsidy to different courses of study crucially depends on what the earnings of current young people will be decades from now, which we cannot hope um, to predict precisely at this point. In the meantime, what we do have is forecasts based on a few years of recent earnings data from um, those who entered the student loan book system in 2012, 2013. And the data that we do have is very limited and very partial, can't possibly be useful um, for predicting the, the value of loan repayments decades down the line. Nonetheless, the government is deciding to focus, in my mind, un unnecessarily on what is um, a largely spurious set of estimates. And it looks at these numbers and it sees itself spending on average about 30% more per student for some humanities degrees than it does for engineering degrees in terms of the subsidy that the taxpayer is going to have to make towards their provision. And it questions whether this pattern of public subsidy is strategically desirable. We just don't know whether it is a sensible basis on which to make policy at this point. But I would believe we can't make policy with as much certainty as we presently are. To my mind, it looks like the last few years of earnings data are both unlikely to, make, to help students make more than the most limited financial calculations about the short-term returns to different courses of study and provide no basis at all for broader value judgments that you might want to make about them. So I would not rely on them at all as a guide to how best to enhance, if I was a, a embarking on my um, higher education, how best to enhance my chances on the job market. And in any case, successful outcomes for both students and society should, of course, be seen as a, about being much more than just pay. Um, there is obvious social value in lower earning professions, such as nursing and social care, and cultural value in studying the arts and humanities. That's why we've deliberately set up our student loan system so that we put in a threshold, um, now about £25,000, that enables people to pursue socially useful but low earning careers. Higher levels of education are associated with wider participation in politics and civil affairs and better physical and mental health. Assessing this wider social and cultural value is very difficult, but government should continue to work to ensure that wider considerations than just earnings are taken into account in its policy and funding decisions. In the meantime, I think it would do higher education and the country as a whole a grave disservice if the Treasury continues to succumb to the temptation effectively to defund non-STEM subjects. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is effectively what is happening at the moment with the current tuition fee freeze. It disproportionately affects non-STEM subjects because the high, higher cost STEM subjects are to a greater or lesser extent receiving top-up grant funding through the teaching grant to the Office for Students that it then administers on a per capita basis to universities, whereas the, the non-STEM courses are not and are seeing the 
headline value of the £9,250 mm. relentlessly eroded by inflation to the extent that it's now worth about £6,600 in real terms. So we are already seeing the de facto defunding of non-STEM courses in how our system operates. And this could get a lot worse because, as you will have seen, there are increasing numbers of people in our policy-making firmament who are calling not just for differential funding of, of, uh, of courses by, the, by this mechanism, but also actual numerical controls on the numbers of students who can apply to study different types of course. So were student number controls to be introduced, my sense is that they would be, in the first instance, most likely to impact the sorts of non-STEM courses that we're concerned about here tonight. The institutions would be capped on the number of um, social sciences and humanities and creative subjects that they can enrol and left free to pursue the demand-led recruitment that they do presently for STEM courses. This would be um, a big change to our system and for a government committed to levelling up, it would obviously be a very perverse policy choice as it would essentially leave the humanities and social sciences, if it were applied in that way, as the preserve of those socioeconomic groups who were already very well represented in higher education. The current funding system, which saw student number controls released in 2012, 2013, may not be perfect. To my mind, it's the least bad of all available systems. One of its positive features for me um, is the fact that it has enabled the participation gap to narrow significantly over time with the progression rate for the most advantaged quintile increasing by eight percentage points since 2010 compared to 12 percentage points for the most disadvantaged quintile. But the gap today is still very wide at 30 percentage points between the top 20% most represented postcodes and the bottom 20 uh, most represented, least represented postcodes. If we impose number controls today, I believe that would be a completely unconscionable thing to do. It would effectively arrest the narrowing of that participation gap and freeze the system pretty much where it is today. It might be a policy that the UK wants to contemplate um, in 10, 15, 20 years' time when we've made much more progress in closing that participation gap. But I don't think we should seriously consider that as a, as a responsible policy today. The impact would be felt far beyond the humanities and social sciences. It would also be felt crucially in the narrowing of UK, UK higher education and erode one of our greatest strengths of our system, which is the breadth and the strength, <coughs> the strength in breadth of our, of our higher education system. So this report um, deserves a very wide hearing in government, and I hope it helps us avert a very, a very grave policy mistake. Oh, good. Thank you, Joe. Such a clear outline of the challenges there. Now, I just uh, with a little bit of redirection um, from the panel on Joe's to respond to Joe's point. But just to say, I, I didn't put my hand up for the humanities thing because I'm a social scientist and I, I'm, I'm, I'm chair of the campaign for social science, part of the Academy of Social Sciences. So we feel very allied in this uh, in terms of the objectives and, and things. And we actually had Joe come and do a little session for deans of social science about the these types of challenges that we are facing and the, and Joe was very direct back to us in terms of we need to man up uh, and uh, woman up and um, uh, make the case and uh, so I guess uh, Joe I'll just uh, be good to just reflect uh, any more reflections from you about how we change that rhetoric and case is there what should we be doing to help ourselves um. well I mean it's a crucial period clearly because um, we're maybe no more than 15 months away from a general election. Um, all political parties are gearing up their manifesto processes, starting to think hard about how they can say as little as possible about higher education. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I would, I, would, I would try and ensure that you know, you, you're putting policy, the, the people in the respective policy manifesto writing teams on the spot and ensuring that you know, they, they don't make pledges which are going to you know, harm the UK higher education system. 
um, and that they understand the, the value of a broad system um, and the dangers of, of um, restricting uh, or trying to make false economies mm. by, by defunding the, the humanities and social sciences and putting all our eggs in the STEM basket. So I would, you know, I would use the use use the manifesto writing processes mm. as a forcing mechanism yeah. to try and get them to think seriously about these issues. Great, great advice, Marion. Any reflections on any you've heard as a report author before we go to others? On yeah, really um, interesting points there. Um, great stuff from Molly and from Joe. Uh, just three things I think I'd like to say to uh, bring a few things out of this. And the first is that we've touched on other kinds of value other than economic value in the payback of a degree. I just want to mention my colleague Roberta Communion, who can't be with us tonight, but has just published last month a report on the social value of arts and practice and culture-based degrees particularly. And that's a really brilliant report in that it tries to start to quantify social value and talks about the amount of um, uh, community work and all of these things that different groups of people in the community bring mm -hmm. and the, 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 the aspects that people who graduate from those degrees, what they bring which hasn't been captured within the economic data is really, really considerable and that report absolutely shines a spotlight on that. So I do want to flag up that report which I think along with this report these make a really good companion pieces. Um, but Joe, your point about, you know, we we're trying to make decisions on the current scenario when the future is going to look incredibly different and what we, can, what we know from history does work is variety, strength, this is what you've said, this is what you've both said really, strength lies in preserving that variety, robustness lies in having a wide variety of tools to approach the future with and what we know is that the, universe, the, the UK currently has this incredibly distinctive strength in the humanities if we let that go now, we would be incredibly foolish in terms of future proof proofing um, for the country. But I do think, and this is something that I think you've both touched on as well, this is not about, this is not calling for complacency. We can't be complacent in the humanities. The humanities need to keep involving. We need to keep reaching broader audiences. And I think we haven't always been as proactive as we can be in reaching out to broader audiences. Um, and we need to do so much more around that. I think that's a crucial part of making this case, is taking the skills and expertise that we give to students and putting it in packages that will deliver it more directly to people where they are, rather than always expecting people to come to where we are. So I do think there's a lot of work still to be done, and this isn't just about saying we're great, we can just remain great. No, we actually need to do quite a lot of work on that aspect. Um, one final thing I think we haven't talked about, interestingly, and which you might all want to talk about, is the association often that's coming out of the rhetoric these days around the humanities with woke leftism. Mm. And it's interesting that we haven't talked about that, actually. Uh, but I just, if, if I can have just a, a couple of minutes to say a bit about this. Um, Hepi actually did another report in 2019 after the government reshuffle and found that over half, the majority of members of the Conservative cabinet had a humanities degree. So I think that in itself is somewhat of a, a nail in the coffin about humanities being you know, much more strongly allied with, with leftism. I also want to just tell a very briefly a story about one of the most informative and transformative days in my academic career, which was being invited to talk at the US Military Academy at West Point. Why was I, as an English professor, being invited to talk at the West Point Military Academy? Because they have majors in literary studies. They used to only teach engineering, long way, long time ago. Now they have majors in every single discipline. Why would a cadet aiming to be one of the you know, top uh, ranking officers in the US Army, why would they choose to major in literature? That's a question that I asked the cadets that I had lunch with. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they're a significant minority of the students there who've chosen to study this. And the cadet to my left said, well, I realised the importance of studying English and studying literature was really, for me, about understanding it's not just about communicating to be understood, it's about communicating not to be misunderstood. And the level of sophistication we teach and the level of expertise our students get through a literary and uh, language training 
allows them in these very high pressure jobs, high pressure situations, to know that they can communicate in ways in which they won't be misunderstood. That, if you think about it, is an unbelievably valuable skill. Mm -hmm. The cadet on the other side of me said, oh, well, actually, when I was on a peacekeeping mission in Afghanistan, the most useful piece of knowledge to me, other than my basic military training, was my knowledge of the ancient Persian poet Rumi. This completely floored me. I was thinking, OK. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, to, to actually work with my Afghan comrades, to make that connection, poetry is incredibly important to that culture. And my knowledge of the poetry of Rumi really made it possible for me to forge those links, to work with my colleagues, and to get that peacekeeping job done. So I bring out these examples mm. as very much <laughs> the opposite, if you like, of some of the rhetoric around it's all about you know, woke lefty agendas. There, we, we have a very, very broad potential audience for the humanities. We need to make sure we are talking to all of those people and talking to all of those people effectively. And that's the work that we as a community really need to do. Mm. Really good point. Yeah, really good to bring that up. And just a little plug for lots of the work that we've been doing on culture wars and how they relate to free speech in universities. A much more nuanced picture than is often portrayed while there's still being challenges there. And it made me think of uh, one other point about the rhetoric around this, because Joe was very, it's a very salutary warning about the supply, um, supply constraints that may be coming to this. But there is also demand impact from this rhetoric potentially as well. One of the things that we're hoping that we get into in our, in our more policy focused work and is around um, the extent to which some of this rhetoric is, is reducing aspirations for higher education generally as well as for particular disciplines because there is some signs after years and years of people saying there's going to be a decline in aspiration for higher education and it not really being the case. There is some signs of some decline in that among the population as a whole. And I think that's tragic as a, as a unwanted consequence of, of this in, in many could ways. You, and it's, speak, you, uh, <coughs> sorry. Well yeah, no, sorry, that is me. And I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm sort of croaky <laughs> as well, unnecessarily croaky. Yeah, so just saying that the, uh, the rhetoric is important in potentially constraining demand, future demand, the aspiration for future demand for a higher education. People do not make the distinction about attacks on particular aspects of higher education. Say it's, you can't carve out people's image of higher education into this is humanities, this is social sciences, when people are thinking, do I want my kids to go to university? There isn't that clarity of, of understanding. So I think specific messages, messages that seem to be specifically targeted on particular areas, are actually heard by the public as a general sector, I think. That is the worry. We're not saying that there's evidence for that, and we're not, uh, we're not saying that that's a big trend, but that's something to really be aware of, because once you, once you d decrease those aspirations, that's very difficult to get back up again, and you don't really want to do that, um, given the, the true value of higher education. Great. Um, so uh, we also we are we are uh, very privileged to have I think some of the authors co-authors for the report in the audience, and I'm just going to read out the names and see. I think we've got a microphone, at uh, a couple of microphones actually at some point. Uh, so I'm just going to read out uh, some of the names and then just if you've got some comments, uh, Susan Fitzmorris, Nigel Harkness, Gail Marshall, Federica Simoni. I think uh, any. Any of the authors, I'm not going to pick out any individuals. You don't have to if you don't want to, but yes, we've got one in the middle over here. Any reflections from what you've heard? Thank you. Um, I'm Gail Marshall, sitting next to Susan Fitzmaurice, who I'm oh, sure want to speak to. Um, it's, I'm very grateful to Marion for pulling out all of our ideas together. I think this report amplifies what a lot of individual disciplines have been talking about and working towards for a long time, so that's incredibly helpful. Um, the rhetoric around globally leading, I think, is very interesting. We are, and I'm very happy to kind of sign up to that idea. But the idea that we're globally leading, possibly um, camouflage, is one of the real strengths of what we do, which is that we collaborate. And we collaborate as part of our working practices, but we also, collaboration is part of what we study as well. So it's a very holistic kind of relationship, I think. So we study and we do communication. We study and we do critical thinking. Um, and I think this means that how we work becomes incredibly effective. How we work means that we can affect solutions which perhaps are not available to other disciplines. So as we're thinking about some of the big global challenges around health humanities, around social justice, around the environment, I think what we do from our perspective as, as humanities 
scholars and students is that we can bring new kinds of language, new kinds of structure, new kinds of knowledge to these problems. And we can help to model solutions by, by getting the, the thinking to mm. kind of shift in yeah. really interesting ways. We can refocus attention and efforts in ways that can give new languages, new structures, and provide solutions which are perhaps not available to other disciplines. So I think that's, that's really, I think a lot of what you've said has really focused my sense of that. A couple of connected thoughts. I think the point about levelling up is incredibly important, and I think the fact that humanities is perhaps not as well understood as it might be means that certain sectors of society are ruling themselves out of really interesting parts and really interesting opportunities within the higher education system. I think particularly perhaps of, of young men, of working class communities, of diverse communities which are not as well represented as they might be. Um, I think we also need to maintain coverage across the sector, again speaking to that need for diversity and collaboration to affect us and enable us to do what we do best. So there is a big question around how to make this all land. Um, and if we've got any solutions in the room today, that would be incredibly helpful. <laughs> but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And I'll hand over to Susan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, yeah, Susan Fitzmaurice. Um, I think I'd just like to say two things. I think we need to resist the, the sense that we're in a perma crisis. I think we've got to argue for the resilience um, of the arts and humanities. And indeed, we have a huge opportunity, um, I think, to start to drive the real questions that are at the heart of those big challenges. You know, STEM provides the methods, they provide the tools, but they don't necessarily, and they provide the data, but they don't necessarily always provide the right thinking and the critical thinking and the judgment um, and the ethical considerations that are required to really try to solve those problems. And I'd like to see this particularly happen um, around leveling up and, and, and indeed um, urban regeneration, because I think there's a huge placemaking uh, project um, that is going on. And I think we do that urban regeneration at our, uh, at our peril if we don't um, encourage and indeed um, uh, ask uh, humanities graduates, arts graduates, uh, and practitioners uh, who have the uh, skills to collaborate and co-produce with um, the, the, the economists clearly and, and, um, uh, 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 and other organizations in, the, in that way. Um, I'm very grateful to the panel for bringing out some of these, these points and certainly to uh, Marion for uh, heading this up. I think this is a great opportunity to change the rhetoric and to advertise the impact um, of, of the humanities research um, across the board. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Is there any other authors? While, while, while we hear from, I assume it's Nigel. It is, it is Nigel. <laughs> oh, good guess. Uh, do think of questions for the panel as well, because we come to the audience uh, next for questions. Nigel. So thank you, everyone. Yes, it's Nigel Harkness, one of the people who contributed to this, but really led by, by Marion. And I've come here from Newcastle University this evening. I think there are a number of things that have come through this evening. I think one of the questions for us in the room as we leave is, I think, how we take that message about the social utility of humanities outside this room. I mean, Joe Johnson spoke to that. In fact, you all spoke to that question of value and how we reframe that. We, it feels like we've lost the argument on economic value of the humanities your points about the Treasury, or sorry, a humanities degree, I should reframe that, with the Treasury. How do we get around other arguments that can really win hearts and minds? And I was, you know, the point that Molly made about the, the real wealth of data that we've got from the recent Research Excellence Framework exercise about the impact that our colleagues right across the sector are having through their work in arts and humanities, but also social sciences, um, and Bobby as well. So I think there's something there about how we, we really try and take that. There is something about our social utility, our social impact, that really should be, that is one way of framing our value, shifting the rhetoric and winning hearts and minds. But I think there's also something about the diversification of our sector that isn't fully understood. Humanities is not what it was 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, some of the things that we're doing now probably are not as visible as they should be. Gail's point about collaboration, really across disciplines, are we really getting that 
message out there, or is there still a view that it's the single honours English degree or your history of 19th century France, I'll pick my own um, discipline and, and, and subject area here. So I think there's something about how we're working in environmental humanities, digital humanities, you mentioned health, um, health um, humanities as well. There are lots of ways mm. in which we are connecting, we are evolving, and I think we've got to tell that story as well beyond this room, where, as you perhaps alluded to earlier, um, Bobby, we've got the danger of speaking to the choir. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. So any other questions from, further questions from people? Yes, please, and I'm keen for the people who didn't put their hands up as humanities professionals or background to, to contribute as well but yes please perfect hi there tom lewis universities uk um really interesting discussion and uh, joe you very eloquently put sort of reflected on the issues for the he sector and uh, challenges that we face going into the uh, to the election um it was really disheartening to see andrew jenkins at the uh, party conference uh, mention harry potter degrees and and sort of buying into this narrative of um of low value so i wonder this sort of quite direct question i wonder whether each panelist could sort of suggest one data point or one um argument that we really should be advancing to cut through with both the media and those sort mm -hmm. of political stakeholders that we're struggling to engage with i mean i know we've got buy-in from this room here but the uh, the wider world and those people we have to influence is uh, is quite different. So yeah, one one data point or one sort of reflection would be interesting to hear. Yeah, brilliant question. What a great question. And I was going to take them in pairs and things, but actually, it's such a good question. Let's just go straight into. I haven't given you any time to think, but uh, let's go straight into. Marion, one data point or one. Yes, story. I'm I'm happy to go first, but uh, I'm going first and probably stealing another bit of Molly's data. I probably <laughs> read this in the British Academy report, so apologies, Molly. Um, but yes, um, as we quote in the report, over 80% of employers don't want specific subject matter degrees. They want a higher level of education. Um, and I think that's really important. It's not about sifting out, these are the good things to learn about, these are the bad things to learn about, these are the things that it's not worth learning about. Employers want people who've learned how to learn, and they want people who've, learned, who've generated those sort of higher level sophisticated skills in handling information, in researching and communicating. So the exact subject matter is not the key thing. That's what employers are telling us. That's not what we as a university sector are saying. That's what the employers are saying. So I think it's a little bit, it's potentially a bit of a red herring to say, you know, is it, is it better or more valuable to study this or that or the other? That's, that's a very striking data point. Molly, did I steal that from you? But no, but I was going to use a, 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 a skills one as well. I mean, I just think tying it back to, to the economy. So we've give, you know, I use the eight out of 10 fastest growing sectors of, of the economy with the small caveat, which is in the actual report that comes from, we are updating that data. So, you know, just because of the lag in, in getting that data, but, but I'd be surprised if it didn't hold to some extent. And, and this fact that I said, you know, in, in my remarks that employment rates for graduates from, uh, and you know, again, our data is across social sciences, humanities, and the arts, but we can go into it and break it down, is, is almost identical to that from, from STEM. So actually, if you just look at what's out there in the economy, you know, th this just doesn't hold true, and, and, it, and it's what businesses are looking for and are hiring. Mm. Um, I think the revealed behavior of MPs is, is, is important. I think whilst many might be critical of, you know, some, some aspects of the sector, if you ask them whether they support the institution in their own constituency, they would die in the ditch to defend it. <laughs> um, and I think that tells you a lot about the value that they see institutions providing uh, locally. But if you want a data point, uh, other than other than that, you know, there's the graduate premiums r robust holding firm over time, mm. um, and I would point to you know the most highly performing knowledge economies around the world having rates of participation in tertiary education far higher than ours. So if you look to you know South Korea, Japan, Canada, Israel, you know they're up in the 60s, 70s percent, and uh, we've we've barely crossed the 50 percent mark. Mm. Great. Great points. I mean, a more general reflection on that is um, uh, less about the sector, more about the disciplines. But I, I think the sector and discipline points are equally important. Is that uh, the, the Academy of Social Sciences and the British Academy doing a project now, um, extracting some of the key, key case studies, key stories, and facts from the REF 
um, uh, 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 impact case studies to try to work through exactly what those are. Because I think the reflection is, certainly from an Academy of Social Sciences and a mm. campaign for social sciences point of view, is that STEM has been incredibly organised in its messaging and consistency as a sector of these are the, these are the things that we add. We have not been as nearly as consistent as partly we don't we haven't organised those stories and then we haven't come together to tell those sorts of stories. Mm. But work with the British Academy, um, getting that checklist of what are the top ten things that you need to just keep repeating mm. over and over again is something that I think we should all aspire to. And, and I think we're within touching distance of having that mm. that type of um, that type of uh, crib sheet for that. I did see there was one right at the back there. Yes, there we go. First and and then George down in the front here and then, oh sorry, yes, so go there, then there, yeah. Hello, uh, hello, my name is Laura Carmona. I'm employed as the Director of Policy and Engagement at Creative UK, um, the UK's representative body for those in the cultural sector and creative industry. Um, I had a, a slightly pointy question, which I wondered if you would respond to in good spirits. Um, and as someone yes. who's interested in driving system change, and that's sort of where I've tried to develop my professional expertise, I think when you struggle to change the system itself, which is some of what I hear Lord Johnson describing, um, if you work from the premise that you're setting out Lord Johnson, that economists essentially, you didn't say this, but economists <coughs> essentially rule the world, then perhaps it would behove on those of us in the room and those on the panel to change the minds of economists. And I think um, Andy Haldane, when he was still chief economist at the Bank of England, wrote an absolutely banging forward to a bit of um, text called Econocracy, which describes very clearly through empirical research about what's happening in HEIs here in the UK, that essentially economics as a practical discipline has lost its divergence of discourse. So I wonder if those of you on the panel have any view as to whether economics itself as a discipline needs reforming in order to facilitate the humanities you know, in a more structured way to allow us to measure things other than just hard ROI. I hope that question is quite clear. Thank you. Great, 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 great pointy <laughs> question. <One from> Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Let's take a couple on this round because we will, so I do, there was a, Guy there in the oh you got it yeah there we go and then to the front mm. we'll take those three. Hi there, um, Tom Owen Smith. I used to work at Kings, but now I work for an organisation called Sums Consulting, and a lot of the work I do these days is around the sustainability space and increasingly around, I guess, different forms of value really, and I note. Um, quite a lot of trends towards thinking about that in society as a whole and also even amongst economists. So uh, people might have seen Mark Carney has written a book about it. There's even quite a lot of material from people like the World Economic Forum around thinking about different forms of value and how they all, I guess, input into the economy and create different types of outputs as well. Um, so I think that the humanities has a massive role to play there has got a massive role in um, areas such as you know, sustainability, thinking about how, as humans, we may live in a world with different types of resource constraints in the future, or an economy that's not predicated on continuous exponential growth, et cetera, et cetera. Many, so many insights there, so it was really great to hear this. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the skills. Jules, about, you know, we said that humanities graduates can do this and, and can do that. Do we have counterfactuals which say it's more difficult for people who have studied other subjects to do these things, or it's more difficult to train those people in a range of things later? Um, and I haven't had a chance to read the report yet, really want to it. So maybe that stuff is all in there, but I was just wondering if, if you feel that we kind of need more data to help us make these arguments in the support of humanities that we all want to do. Great. Thank stuff. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And George, just one at the front. We'll take a three if we can. And then we'll maybe get another round in. Hi, Simon Tanner from Digital Humanities at King's. Um, I wanted to ask a question about lifelong learning and the role of universities. You know, if we're hearing that, um, I heard some government data which was suggesting that 20 year olds will likely have to reskill four or five times hmm. during their careers. We've got people living much longer. Um, you know, if we take the focus away from uh, just the 18 to 25 year old area, what's the role of universities in lifelong learning and lifelong skills? Great, great stuff. I maybe we go in this order. 
first on this one, Joe. Great. You um, well, picking out of any of those. The, the reform of economics one, I'm going to leave to the to the pros if I if I can. But I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to focus on the skills. <coughs> the question was a very interesting one. I do think we do need a more robust evidence base to assert with confidence that humanities grads are going to be more resilient because they could do these things like creative mm. thinking and critical thinking. And we do need a stronger evidence base to say that you know those who haven't studied humanities have are less well equipped in that respect. So I think we'd be more compelling. So I agree with you 100% on that. On lifelong learning, great question. I mean, I think you know the easy game has been for universities to focus on the 18 to 20 year old learner, the first time degree student, and that's where the big bucks have been. And I think the really welcome policy development is is the lifelong learning and lifelong loan entitlement coming in in 25 26 for uh, level four level five studies certificates and diplomas in 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 england and that will really mean that universities who want to play in that space and it won't be everybody it won't be for the russell group i doubt but the more vocational technical oriented universities those that are closer to the labor market um, will start to, I think, reinvent themselves as institutions of lifelong learning and start to gravitate much more towards um, the adult learner and away from the core, the, what has traditionally been their core business of serving the first time degree student. So I think there will be a, a, sh a shift because you know, people will follow the money and the money hasn't been available in the way it will be for that. Um, and and that's, a well, that's a really welcome change. Great. Thank you. Molly. Um, y yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll say something sh short about each. Um, skills, you, you, I, I would agree. Um, you know, I, I think we do need uh, more uh, data and understanding. I mean, you're, you're, the way you phrased the question, actually, you ended in a place I didn't think you were going to get to, but it's really interesting about counterfactuals. Um, so I, 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 on one level, to come back to on that, I think it's a really um, good challenge back. The one thing I, I would say uh, is just um, there is within government, within DFE, but it's got cross-departmental remit, a unit for future skills, uh, which is a really interesting development. It's been chaired by um, uh, Ian Diamond, who's our national statistician. He's also um, a fellow of the British Academy. He's probably a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and, mm -hmm. and, and, and a really um, you know, eminent uh, scholar in his own right. Um, and, and actually, I've been really encouraged by the kind of thinking that that unit is doing and is trying to join up uh, across different agendas is trying to think about what uh, kind of some of the future uh, needs of the economy are going to be. But obviously, you know, A has to, you know, respond to government vision. And, you know, we actually just had a discussion about that at the advisory group last week. A and they are grappling with some of these questions around um, future data needs. So it's all to say I think there's a real shared um, understanding and desire for more data. And, and there are people who are trying to push that agenda uh, forward. Um, on lifelong learning, I think it's absolutely um, the right question to ask. Uh, in, a, in a report that we did on um, uh, uh, the, the long-term societal implications of COVID, uh, one of the actual recommendations that we did say was this need to really invest and think about lifelong learning and join up you know, across the education system in local um, areas that schools, secondary schools, uh, FE colleges, uh, and universities. I'll just say as a very small kind of subset on that, we just, um, earlier this year, maybe end of last year, I can't remember, I've lost track of time, um, put out a report on trying to understand what provision in languages was in further education. Um, and actually incredibly hard to get data on that from the further education sector. Um, it's a really interesting report. Uh, it was written by researchers at Queen's University Belfast, and we've done some briefing material that sits on top of it. But back to the data you know, and, and evidence point, uh, if we are going to start to think about how we invest in that and support that lifelong learning, we do need to think about how we support the further education sector um, across all sorts of different areas and skills so we really get good data on it. And actually, there's a really surprising lack of data across the sector I think actually higher education is very well served by data but um, you know secondary uh, education and further education actually there's lots of gaps and we should all probably be a bit more horrified by that when we're trying to think about good good policy um, economists um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna duck that only because I haven't <laughs> done um, a huge amount of thinking on it I mean but it, but it's a very good challenge I would say it's probably also a challenge to go back not to make everything the problem of, of Treasury um, and uh, but, but I do think there is a 
need to really think much more broadly about the way in which we do capture value and have return on investment. There is a lot of really good thinking, I think, starting to go into, um, I hope I don't get the colors of the books wrong, is it the green book that Treasury uh, uses, but, you know, and, and, and I do know they are starting to think about how do they move away from that very, um, you know, sort of uh, linear thinking about return on investment to incorporate more um, uh, different ways of thinking about value. We are thinking about that a lot from the uh, research sector side of it and working very closely with um, DSIT and other departments, uh, partly heading into the spending review, but to try to capture a lot more of the nuanced way of thinking about value. So I think some of that thinking is going on, but it does need a lot of pushing. Um, and, uh, and, and economists uh, you know, probably do need to engage in that, but I'm not an expert on the uh, discipline. Um, okay. Sorry to duck it. No, 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 <laughs> it was good, that was useful. Thank you. So I'll, I'll come at these perhaps in, in reverse order and start with the lifelong learning point, which I think is, it, this is crucial. You know, we have to get better, as I say, at, at speaking to broader audience, speaking to more people, going to where they're at. Um, I'm just gonna give one little example from what we're doing at King's which is we've gone into the online learning space with the arts and humanities. Online learning traditionally at King's and generally has been focused around business studies and law and some medicine courses. We've got this very innovative new mm. course, repackaging some of our core expertise from the humanities in a way that takes it out there very much for people who are in work, people in the middle of their careers, very different age range. We've had huge success with this course. Emily Palinja, one of my colleagues I think might be here um, tonight, and uh, colleagues from classics and modern languages to bits of the sector that have traditionally been cited as being in crisis permanently. But you know those skills are being taken out. They're speaking to a very, very broad range of uh, new people who we wouldn't otherwise be bringing into the institution necessarily to do a degree in French, but we're getting that expertise out there. So I think this is incredibly important for the work we need to do. In terms of data, I think we have not enough and I think we have too much in that, and this comes back to this point, I think it was very well made at the start about economics and economists. Um, there is something about the way the rules of this game are set up that's particularly uh, not playing into the kinds of ways, the methodologies we have as humanists, I think. And this is uh, perhaps what you were thinking of in your question. Um, and do you all know the, the programme more or less, the Radio 4 show, right? What a brilliant, brilliant show is that. We don't need maths at A-level, we need more or less. Everybody doing that. Kind of like if, if any of you don't know what we're talking about, find out, because you should know about this. But that's what we need people doing to 18, is the kind of skills that they're teaching more or less, is how to have a very sophisticated understanding of data. We have too much data and it's being too poorly interpreted most of the time. This was the point about the little example I started with about philosophy losing market share since 500 BC. That is a data point. But, you know, I don't think we're getting these data points being interpreted in very intelligent or contextually sensitive ways. And that's where the more qualitative stories that are the bread and butter of a lot of humanities methodologies need to actually come in and be a little bit more part of this discourse. We constantly think that data is somehow terribly objective. Once you get a number and it's 75 or it's 45, oh, well, that's it. That's the answer. But it rarely is. And we need to contextualize some of what we see coming out of economics and out of this plethora of data, actually, with a better way of reading it, a better way of interpreting it, a better way of contextualizing it that brings the qualitative into that story. Really good, really good. So I'm, I'm completely conscious that the Arsenal Man City team news will <laughs> have been published by now, so I am getting increasingly nervy about that. But uh, before we finish, there is um, there are a couple of uh, colleagues from the faculty here, Catherine Boyle and uh, Will Wooten. Um, so I just give a bit of privilege at the end here to any final thoughts or comments before we hear for any final reflections uh, from the panel. And, um, and uh, is it here? Yes. I think it's here. So any, any reflections? Right, thank you very much. So my name is uh, Dr. Will Witten and I am <clears throat> the head of classics. I mean, it's a great pleasure to be here and to represent in a way sort of classics, uh, a very traditional humanities discipline. Um, and I think to speak maybe a bit just on behalf of my department, which I think has really been demonstrating the value of the humanities 
in so many different ways. And I think, you know, to me, what it's about is clearly defining what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, and I think what we've managed to do, I guess, within our department, which I think is certainly transferable, is championing the breadth and diversity of what we do. Um, and thinking clearly both about the relevance of uh, the past and its relevance to the present. What is extraordinary about looking at the ancient world is the possibility to have a microcosm that you can investigate with a data set. We've said a lot about data. Um, but with a data set that's small enough to interrogate in really interesting ways. Classics has played a major role in the early development of digital humanities, for example. Um, and I think it continues to play a, a major role in how we think about the present by using that past as a playground, as an investigative opportunity to critically think. Um, and we do that with our students, and I think we do that in the sort of high-quality research that we do, um, and also in the sort of way we transfer that into impact. Um, and again, I sit next to a colleague who works on opera antiquity and antiquity. I have colleagues who work in very sort of traditional areas where you might think humanities disciplines might have impact, contemporary art and the classics. There was an artist in residence um, here in Bush House just last week working on reinventing the classics um, for contemporary art. We work a lot with museums and galleries from accessibility to display, um, things like the art market and the politics of repatriation, cultural heritage and protection in times of conflict. But we also do extraordinary things, and I think I'll also demonstrate why the humanities do extraordinary things. Um, working in uh, conflict resolution in South America, using the classics to think about questions around religious persecution um, or how to resolve um, contemporary issues of international adoption. And I think, you know, there's just an extraordinary panoply of uh, why the humanities is valuable. And from my point of view as the head of the Department of Classics, I can say that I think Classics does an excellent job in demonstrating exactly that point. Thank you. Who was the other person? Oh, behind you. Yeah, <laughs> there we are. I'll come out from behind the food oh, and join you. You might wonder why I'm standing up. I'm Catherine Boyle, the other person that yes. was mentioned. <laughs> Don't Thank worry, Catherine. I'm not an interloper. Um, I thought I'd got off with saying nothing, actually, <laughs> and I'm having a bit of a psychedelic experience here, <laughs> um, just listening. I think, I think the question of are the humanities in crisis depends on where you're coming from. I don't think the humanities are in crisis. I think that's the political and structural systems that are here supposed to be supporting the humanities are definitely in crisis. I think that um, everything we've heard has got to do with political will, with institutions. The question of whether humanities is in crisis has been here since I started my first job in 1987. I've got a report here from the Modern Languages Association in the States and the president talks about 50 years of crisis in the humanities in the States and calls for a joined up um, national strategy to say, one of the things he says is everyone for presidents to advisors agrees that the humanities are central to the university while implying that their main time is past and I think that's what we've been discussing tonight. I think, why do I say the humanities in crisis? I'm here you know, like everyone else, we've gone through COVID, we've taught, we've taught with our students, we're living the aftermath of COVID, we're living in a situation where the people who are least thought about actually in terms of the impact of probably <laughs> academic staff in this situation. And, I'm, and I want to say that humanities are not in crisis because I live it every day and I see the inventiveness, I see what Will's doing, I see people doing work in the, the humanities. I don't have an experience of people in humanities being complacent about our role in the world. I don't have an experience of people in the humanities being complacent about impact, about education, about the people around us. I see us fighting against systems that keep making it more and more difficult. I think I've been, well, I know I've been asked to speak because for the last, 
I don't know, when, when was 2016? I've forgotten when 2016 was. Um, that I've been di uh, principal investigator on a project called Language Acts and World Making, which was part of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, Open World Research Initiative. I'm telling you all the words because I don't want all the acronyms because nobody would understand me. And the, that was one of the biggest amounts of money that Arts and Humanities, well, was the biggest amount of money that Arts and Humanities had ever put into modern languages. And we were one of the flagship programmes that was here, that was created in order to transform um, modern languages research and teaching. Um, did we do it? I think we did. I think we did it in terms of research and I think we did it in terms of how we approach it. What There are many things that we failed to do. And I'm thinking about your question, um, your comments about STEM, about our messages from the very beginning of this huge project. We had messages, we had policy, we had legacy um, agreements. You can, you can still see them online, you can still see them. Um, we worked with government, we worked with, with policy. And you know, and one of the most depressing things that's happened was that we were supposed to be were asked to advise on the GCSE reforms in modern languages, which basically destroy anything that say that languages are not to do with culture. Um, and we weren't listened to, and the reforms have gone in. And now we work with schools, with teachers and schools who are asking us to come and help them, these great teachers, to revive languages and language learning. Here's an area where humanities is known to be effective, to known to be, we have the skills, we have the knowledge, we have the experience, and we had the will, and we were t speaking to government, and, it's, and it failed. I do agree that we keep, have to keep managing this, but the humanities, the sector is in crisis, when I speak from that, I speak from the language is in crisis, because languages at schools, are being destroyed. That's the only way we can say it. We are now teaching more and more Abinicio students because of that. I'm saying that because I can't, I'm not going to ever stand up and say the humanities are in crisis. As, hum as, hu as people who are arts and humanities scholars, we don't live a crisis. We do this because we believe and we know what humanities are. We don't have to be told over and over again what it is. We have to have uh, sectors and institutions who will, and I think the question about economic, the different economic forms and thinking are really important. That's what we need. I think this is what this discussion would be. I would retitle it. It's not the humanities in crisis. It's, our, it's, it's um, political will around the humanities. It's infrastructures, it's all of that. That's what's in crisis. And but the, we who are working in humanities work every single day with our students, with people outside, Bringing people in, and the last thing I'll say is one of the things we do with language acts and world making is create a service module at King's. And we do that with, um, with our undergraduate students. It's called language acts and world making laboratory, exciting title. And we work with partners, and we work with partners inside, uh, and we br uh, school partners, and we bring the children into the university. Why is that important? Because we're working with state sector children who don't have access to languages and don't know that they have the right to be with us in the university. So bringing them in is really important. And also in language acts and world making, we had the privilege of having £100,000 for you know, sort of contingency fund. The way we used it was, was to create small grants. We, we um, funded over, 100, we hundred, over 100, 110, I think, projects in UK and uh, worldwide. Um, around languages, language acquisition, languages in the community. When we're told that there's a deficit of languages and we're living in a monolingual country that's not interested in languages, we've got lots of evidence why it's not. And, and I'm saying that because when um, the Auri project started, we were told languages are in crisis, respond to the crisis. And we refused to take the word crisis as that. We refused to start take that as a deficit word. And, that, and I think that's what we have to do. So are the humanities in crisis? No, because we work every day as people in arts and humanities. And we do make a change in the world. And I think the conversation is actually about something else. Great. Well, thank you. And yes, brilliant impact.
and a great way to end with uh, we do make a difference in the world. That is absolutely true. I think uh, with conversations... Uh, can continue over drinks which and nibbles. We've actually got food as well, which is great. Um, so just for me to say uh, thank you to Policy Institute uh, staff and Arts and Humanities, Faculty of Arts and Humanities staff for uh, putting this together. Thanks very much to HEPI for their great support in the publication. Uh, shame that they couldn't be there today because of, here tonight because of a, a clash, but we will be working with them on uh, this into uh, the future and then of course uh, thanks to our uh, excellent panelists and respondents to this and most of all to uh, Marion and the other authors of this uh, great report which has given us such a rich conversation tonight uh, thank you very much everyone <laughs>